the Wellbeing for Real Life podcast. Hello and welcome to Wellbeing for Real Life. In this episode of the podcast, we're talking about connections. I'm Dr. Richard Pyle, GP with a special interest in cardiovascular medicine and lifestyle medicine and author of the book Fit for Purpose. My guest in the studio today, once again, is Dr. Wendy Maleffi. Good morning, Wendy. Hi, Richard. Thank you for having me again. It is lovely to have you back. Uh, Wendy, for those who haven't listened to this podcast before, can you just tell us a little bit about yourself? Right. I'm a GP as well. In fact, Richard and I have worked together, worked together many, many years, years ago. ago. <laughs> <laughs> and... Um, over life, I've also over time, I've also trained, retrained as a wellness coach as well as a mindfulness teacher. Really, disciplines that I feel kind of complement my com- uh, my consultation style. I like to just bring in the whole picture when I consult. Thank you, Wendy. And and the thing we're talking about today is is connections. And I know that you and I both believe that that's one of the really important pillars of well-being you know we, we can talk about sleep and movement and nutrition and those are quite obvious physical things but i think connections with others is is for me probably one of the most important pillars of well-being and i wanted to start by asking you particularly in the context of the pandemic um about loneliness really um do you ever have patients come up to you in the surgery and say doctor i'm lonely <laughs> that's why I'm here. That's why I'm coming to talk to you today. I know. That's a really interesting. Not often, you know, not often. Some patients, you get a sense of it. You know, you. I guess as GPs, we're in that privileged position of really knowing our patients and we know their social circumstances. And we can tell sometimes when perhaps when they're presenting frequently or when they come and the story just doesn't quite fit. Mm. And it's really through digging and asking the right kind of intuitive questions to find out a little bit more about what is the story here that you can have a sense of there might be loneliness mm. here. So really the, the, the question is, um, the answer really is that it doesn't often drop on your lap like, Doc, I'm lonely. I don't know what your experience is, Richard, mm. in, in, in your practice. I, I agree with you. I think usually the people that admit to being lonely tend to be the ones that you've actually spent a bit of time with. So mm. they know you and, and when they're talking to you, it's an ongoing conversation. Yeah. It isn't the first time they've ever met you. Yeah. People don't tend to open with the problem is that I'm lonely. But it, those patients that we see at the surgery a lot, um, the frequent attenders, whether they come to our surgery or to you know, the A&E department, sometimes the, the underlying reason really is that they're essentially lonely. Um, and I think for me, loneliness, I think it's been defined as the, the difference between the quality of the relationships that you have and the quality of the relationships that you'd like to have. And if you've got that, that mismatch, um, I think what people don't realise is that actually it can have real consequences for their physical health. Um, do, do, is that something that you talk to patients about? Yeah, absolutely. It's something to think about. And and it, it and something that you also mentioned, um, some of the patients who come that you know very well and they might allude to the fact that they're lonely. And loneliness is not only when just the sense of being living alone. It, you can be with people or be in a crowd and still feel quite lonely. So there's that to think about as well in terms mm. of what does loneliness mean to you? And it means different things to different people. And um, in itself, loneliness has, you know, mental repercussions. And that in turn will cause other kind of physical problems. Mm. So sometimes you have to find a way in if it's through some physical condition and exploring that a little bit more. But ultimately, you really do have to try and explore the whole story because if you don't address it or if you take the shortcut and just give them a painkiller or something because they complained Mm. about a headache yeah then you're really doing them a disservice you're not really taking a bit more time to just try and figure out what the problem is because it's it's a pandemic waiting to to happen i think the data shows it's something that we might not be aware of but loneliness has lots and lots of other manifestations Mm. It, yeah. it, it does remind me of, of a story of how not to do it. Uh, one of the uh, senior doctors of my practice, whom you and I both know, but I won't name them on the radio. Uh, come on, d- Richard. D- d- come d- on, Did Richard. comment, and this was not actually his issue, but it was his yeah. trainer's issue. So okay. going back a very long time, when this particular friend of mine uh, was a, a trainee GP, he once sat in with his trainer GP and a lady came in 
and her, her presenting complaint, her, her opening gambit, or whatever the term is that you use, was about a headache. And they spent a long time talking about her headache. And my friend, who was a junior GP, was sitting at the back of the room thinking, I don't think the headache's really the problem. And she kept doing what we call dropping cues in the consultation. And she would refer to her relationship, her marriage, the difficulties she was having with her husband. And the GP that was my friend's trainer seemed to ignore every single mention that she made of that, uh, got the consultation over with very quickly, and the patient left the room with a prescription for painkillers for her headache. And my friend was thinking, I have got the world's worst GP as my trainer. How terrible. <laughs> this doctor then turned around to him and said, what do you think that person wanted to talk about? And my friend said, I think she wanted to talk about her marriage. To which the other doctor replied, yes, so did I, but I wasn't going to open that can of worms. <laughs> and I know that we're, we're joking about it, but it illustrates your point perfectly, that if we're not careful, what we end up with is effectively palliating yes. our patients. And by that, you know, in, in the medical world, we use that term, as you and I know, to describe people for whom no further curative treatment is available and we're, we're trying to ease their passing. We can't cure them, we can't fix them, no. but we're just going to make life a bit less uncomfortable for them. And we're comfortable doing that with people who are dying from cancer or heart failure or dementia or just very old age. But the risk, if we don't pick up on those cues and, and have a way to respond to it in, in primary care, in my view, is that what we're effectively saying to them to a 20, 30, 40 year old is, well, I'm sorry that your life is a bit rubbish and that you feel lonely and that your relationships aren't great. But because I'm a doctor who's been trained to look after people with diseases, um, all I can really offer you are, are painkillers or antidepressants and, and good luck. And I think, you know, that's a that's a real challenge to us. It is a real challenge, but I'm just thinking, sitting here thinking, how can we change it then as a, mm. as a profession, I guess? How can we start approaching loneliness or such difficulties, mm. challenges that present in that sort of way? I think that's a really important question. And we, we have seen some acknowledgements of that now. You know, the government uh, has a minister for loneliness. Why? Uh, <laughs> I mean, it's not a job I'd be queuing up for, but I guess, you know, perhaps they get that before they move on to a bigger job. But um, it, it is an important statement of intent, I think. And we know now also that the NHS has invested money in primary care networks. These are collections of GP practices um, so that someone can be employed who is a, a social prescriber. They, they have different names, community navigators, social prescribers, uh, health coaches, key workers. But, but as you and I are, are used to having, the, these people, of course, are, are there for when this situation arises. As a doctor, I might think, I can't really help you with the fact that actually you don't have any close friendships or that you've become bereaved or that you've had a breakdown of your relationship but I know someone who can mm. and in our practice we can refer people into the social prescribers and I explain it to them and say look you know sometimes in life there are things which aren't directly what you might call health related there are things that maybe I as a doctor am not necessarily the best person to help you with but actually this person either can or they can point you in the right direction and I don't know whether you've have you seen uh, that in action, have you seen the benefits of of that in your practice? I think certainly the conversations are being had in that it's beginning we're beginning to realize that it's something that we need to address. Mm. And um, as you and I are aware how time poor we can be as GPS and consultations, it's just about having that at the back of one's mind and thinking a little bit more about it and starting the conversation and signposting. And then something that we haven't really mentioned, I guess, is um, I guess the communities, tribes, how we can encourage people to just be a bit more involved in, I guess, faith-based communities, mm. in uh, other aspects of community where they can be less lonely just to explore a different aspect of life. Um, and signposting, and you've mentioned certainly the, the social prescribing, whereby I think I saw the other day on um, Gardener's World. Do you do any gardening? Do you garden? Uh, not if I can possibly avoid it. Oh, Richard. <laughs> Sorry, that's a shameful admission. Anyway, never mind. Another conversation for another day. But yeah, on Gardener's World, essentially there was a whole um, program dedicated to well-being. And part of this social prescribing involved, social prescribing involved um, recommending um, gardening 
Mm. You know, people going and spending some time gardening with others. It was really life changing for a lot of people. The testimonials that were coming out of there, just because gardening is just about so much more than just putting seeds in the ground. You're going to cultivate that seed without any outcome, any known outcome from that point of view. You, The social aspect of things, you're going to meet other people. Mm. It is your outdoors, you're connecting with the earth. So there's so much more. So mm. I'm trying to convince you to be a gardener I, I, here. I would enjoy it but, if I did it more with other people. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, social prescribing enables them to be able to advocate for that as well. So things like that, um, mm. definitely. I think that's that's a really good point. Uh, Parkrun, for example, the um, the director of Parkrun, whose name I forget, was, was interviewed once and about uh, why Parkrun was set up and yes. what it was. And I think he said uh, Parkrun is a social enterprise uh, masquerading as a or dressed up as a sports event something like that and i i've seen i don't go every week and obviously we haven't been able to go at all sadly for the last year but um i've been a few times in the past and you can see just how much people enjoy it and there are those who are just walking around as well as those who are trying to smash their personal best i, I stay well clear of those people because i don't want to get in their way um and, and you mentioned faith and you know there are lots of examples of great community action um, that, that are often provided by faith groups and, and groups that are obviously not faith-based. Um, the church has been involved in lots of things like, um, well, food banks, for example, in, in during the pandemic and um, just giving people somewhere a, a place to go and talk. A place to go and be talk. Listened to. Yeah, absolutely. And and other voluntary uh, organisations, certainly like the Samaritans, mm. there's something that I remember if I know, especially because I also work for an out of our service whereby you've never met a patient mm. and yet you can sort of sense that turmoil really. And um, it can be difficult in an out of our setting to recommend where people should go in terms of mental health, loneliness aspect of things. So the Samaritans have been very kind of useful in that sort of sense. Mm. I guess there's a faith element to that, but equally they are available mm. from that point of view. So really, really approaching this in that psychosocial and cultural mm. aspect, respecting those. And I think just to go back around the houses slightly, we started off talking about seeing patients in our consultations and loneliness is a real issue because there is good evidence to show that it could knock a significant number of years off your life expectancy in in terms of death from all causes simply through loneliness so if a patient does end up in front of you whilst you may not have um, hours to spend with them and, and the correct answer ultimately may be some signposting and some encouragement would you, if you, if we were talking about sort of tips for for managing loneliness and building connections, what are the kind of things that you might suggest they could consider in, in terms of building or pruning their relationships and their connections? Well, certainly, it's it's just about um, making that investment, especially if loneliness is not necessarily because somebody is alone. It's just because they're feeling a little bit isolated, a bit unwanted, a bit misunderstood. It's about knowing that if you cultivate, invest a bit more in your relationships, it can be fruitful, basically. Mm. So making time for that. And um, one other thing that I was just thinking about is that so often when, I don't know if you've seen it, when you're out there, you'll be out on a res at a restaurant if you can, and uh, people are on the phones and they're not really together. Yeah. You know, guilty of it, I'm not going to lie, mm. but um, something that I'm very mindful of. It's just that sort of awareness yet again of being mindful of making an effort. We are social beings, you know, and just uh, having the courage to connect with other people and talking. It, it is a really important that we talk about these things and seeking help, you yeah. know. If you are feeling lonely, not dressing it up as anything else, just seeking help. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's particularly valid advice at, at the moment as well in, in the pandemic. Um, we know that, as you say, we are social animals. Um, and people who say that they don't need people... It doesn't really make a lot of sense. It's like someone who has a small appetite saying that they don't need food. <laughs> you know, we we need people in different doses, absolutely, <laughs> uh, and we need different qualities and quantities of relationships. And I think we've had to be quite deliberate about it because in the pandemic, we've unwittingly conducted 
the world's largest experiment ever into loneliness. You know, we didn't submit a protocol. We didn't get ethics approval for this dreadful experiment. We just had no choice, but we did it. Yeah. Um, and, and I think going back to your comments about digital technology, it certainly has its place. I did take part in a few Facebook pub quizzes for the first few months before I got really bored of them. <laughs> and, and I have done Zoom calls with, with groups of friends and family. Um, but I think now that we're able to do a bit more face-to-face, even if it's just outdoors at the moment, yes. I, I, there's really no substitute for that. Our, our brain knows the difference between a picture on a screen yes. and a person in front of us as we're sitting talking now. Um, and I think we shouldn't underestimate that. And so your comment about the digital, I think, is really valid because we need to be intentional. And where we can still only see people over a screen because they live too far away or they're not able to travel, because they're poorly or whatever, that's valuable. Yes. But but we shouldn't substitute our our real networks for the, you know with the social network as a instead. Um, so that's one of my tips that I give to patients as well. No, absolutely, I agree with all of that. It it, it actually makes sense in that throughout the last eighteen months or so, we have been deconditioned, and mm. so that had fed that sort of narrative in a sense so it's about you know following on and uh, it's about yeah starting to explore a little bit more safely obviously but it Mm. is about making those making that conceited effort in terms of connecting with others Mm. and just a simple conversation can be so nice. I caught up with one of the, the uh, Ned the florist, uh, who's a, who works in St Albans, and we hadn't seen each other for months because florists are not an essential business. I don't know whether my wife would agree with that, but <laughs> for a while he wasn't able to open. And we caught up the other day and we were chatting away for sort of 10, 15 minutes, having not spoken for ages, and just starting the day with a walk into town in the fresh air and, and connecting with this guy and having a chat, a real meaningful exchange, really from a selfish perspective, it set me up for the day. And actually, that's one of the tips I give to people in that it's good for you, obviously, but to connect with other people, you know, it's good for them and it's good for you. It's a it's a mutually beneficial thing. Every, everybody wins. And, and I've learned that over the last year, I've had some conversations with members of staff and I realised how little I knew about their lives because my standard thing was, hi, how are you? I'm fine. And you? Yeah, I'm fine too. And, you know, you, you've exchanged... You've, if you have, you've had the required pleasantries and that's job done yes and you can't you can't have a half hour conversation with everyone but when you do just every now and again take a moment to think did they drop a cue there when when they said oh i'm fine did they sort of roll their eyes slightly or look yes. a bit resigned yes. and maybe that is a chance for me just to have that extra conversation with them and maybe not do something else and that that connection that it builds between you can be a really powerful thing yeah, changing the culture in the environments that we live in, that mm. we work in, because we spend so much time in this environment. So if we start to just initiate these, what might sound like a little bit of an inane conversation, mm. you're talking and, you know, it makes you feel happy and it makes, you know, life not so stressful. We've mm. talked about stress in our other podcasts, uh, but um, it, it, physiologically, there is that boost in our in our brains that improves those uh you know the the dopamine receptors and so it's i think it's it's important that we do that and i think wendy it feels to me like uh, as we come to the end of the podcast here that we've we've finished on a, on, on a very positive note we, yes. st- we started by talking about how dreadfully lonely we all are but hopefully we've come up with some some good ideas for, for people and, and shared our experiences of that as well um so it's been lovely to have this conversation with you i hope our listeners have got as much out of it as i have Um, And I look forward to speaking to you again soon. Thank you, Richard. It's been lovely to connect with you. And with you, man. Thank you. (laughs) You've been listening to Wellbeing for Real Life with me, Dr. Richard Pyle. If you've enjoyed this episode, please give it a nice review and tell other people about it. If you'd like to learn more, my book, Fit for Purpose, is out now, published by Harper Inspire and available in paperback, ebook, and audiobook. You can also follow me on Twitter, YouTube, and my website, wellbeingforreal.life. This podcast was recorded at Monkey Nut Audiobooks. Until next time, take care of yourself.